In April of 2020, writer Arun Tati Roy wrote that historically pandemics have forced people to break with the past and imagine their world anew. I am here today because I too believe that the difficult times we have faced and continue to face due to COVID-19 have given us an opportunity to pause and imagine our world anew. Reimagining the world anew is critically needed in all areas of social life. And for me, is it is especially urgent issue with regards to women in sports coaching. No one can deny the negative impact that COVID-19 has had on sport. And yet I'm amazed by the ways in which people have and continue to find opportunities to participate in sport. Last year, professional leagues like the WNBA were able to run their seasons in a modified way. And in university sports, the level of sport in which I work as a coach, after a tough year off without any competition, we have finally been approved for league play. However, despite encouraging news of vaccinations and the return to a post-COVID-19 world, we still do not know what the future of sport will look like. As a consequence of these ongoing unknowns, many of us who are engaged in critical sports scholarship are asking ourselves, what of sport will remain the same and what of sport will be forever changed as a result of COVID-19? As a coach and a critical sports scholar, I argue that change must occur as the landscape of sport prior to COVID-19 has too often been fraught and contested terrain for many, including women. In the 1990s, women occupied 54% of head coaching positions in Canadian universities. And yet, as of 2020, women occupy just 16% of those same head coaching positions. Outside of university sport, the numbers are equally disturbing. While the number of athletes participating at the Olympic Games who identify as female has increased substantially over time, women hold just 8% of the head coaching positions at this international level. I have been working in high performance sport as a coach for nine years, and I assure you that there is no shortage of knowledgeable, talented, and dynamic women who would thrive as sport coaches. And yet, as illustrated earlier, the number of women in sport coaching is declining. My own story may offer some insight. I was a high performance athlete who eventually was invited by a coach to try my hand at coaching. I found I enjoyed it and I decided to pursue formal coach education and certification. Opportunities to work as a coach bubbled up through my networks and the successes I had as a coach ultimately led to more opportunities. I have had to work extremely hard to get to where I am in the Canadian sport coaching community and yet it is not at all lost on me that I am the exception in this community and not the rule. There were far too many points in my own story that depended upon luck or being in the right place at the right time. For example, my career in high performance sport coaching continues to this day because of a cup of coffee that I arranged a long time ago with a woman that I barely knew. I did not know who I was about to meet or what I was getting into. This moment is so arbitrary and yet it is the reason I remain in high performance sport coaching today. Some of you might be thinking, great, and perhaps others of you, yeah, I had a similar experience. But what I would like to draw your attention to is that any system where some people are dependent upon luck or being in the right place at the right time is structurally flawed. In order to highlight what I mean by structurally flawed, I would like to draw on the work of C. Wright Mills, who said that neither the life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood in isolation from one another. In other words, in order to make sense of our daily lived experiences, we need to consider our contexts, which includes the history of ourselves and our societies. Mills refers to this idea as the sociological imagination, and it is said that when we view the world through this lens, we begin to realize how our so-called personal concerns are in fact attached to much larger public concerns. The phrasing of personal struggles being connected to public concerns dovetails with the feminist addict 
the personal is political. The personal is political situates our awareness to the multiple and complex interconnections between women's private struggles and larger public concerns. So how is the issue of women in sports coaching a public concern? Well now, more than ever, we have government grants and programs that are dedicated to women in sports coaching. And yet, as illustrated earlier, the number of women in sports coaching is declining. Well, wait a minute, how can that be? Why in a time with more support than ever before are we witnessing the continued decline of women in sports coaching? For me, this illustrates how the issue of too few women in sports coaching is not a woman's issue, but a public issue. The institution of sport has failed to address the lack of women in sports coaching. The current initiatives that are aimed at improving the numbers require our support, but they are limited. If we continue to implement and promote programs that require women to seek them out, and we serve to reinforce for women that they must be dependent upon luck or being in the right place at the right time. If you take a close look at the women who have remained in high performance sport coaching, you will notice that these women have been successful in spite of the environment of sport and not because of it. If you take an even closer look, you will notice that virtually all of these women have elite athlete experience which means that the institution of sport is telling women that if you exist outside of elite sport and you want to get involved in elite sport as a coach, you had better not waste your time competing with the women who have had athlete experience. I'm frustrated alongside my friends and women who can relate to this reality. I'm also frustrated alongside the women who battle hard on a daily basis to live another day as a coach. And if it is the case that these women are let go, the institution of sport and people within it pathologize them. When we pathologize women, we treat them as if their removal is a personal issue rather than a politics of sport issue. And in the case of women in sports coaching, it is as if we are putting them in a time machine and sending them back to the 1970s with the early waivers in their march to make the personal is political known. It is as if we are repeating history. And so I ask you, are we going to continue telling young women that their chances of becoming a head coach are dependent upon being in the right place at the right time? Are we going to tell these women that their chance of donning a head coach title is dependent upon a cup of coffee? I'm ready for the end of this pandemic and the return to sport pre-COVID-19. It is clear that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women, particularly racialized women. And I fear that if we do not break with the past, post-pandemic sport will continue to be inhospitable for women, particularly those in sport coaching. And yet I come back to Arund Hati Roy's words about the pandemic and the potential for this time. She writes that the pandemic is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next, and that if we choose, we can walk through it, ready to imagine a new world and ready to fight for it. I'm ready, and I invite you to join me so that we might make a better world for us all. Thank you.